Hey there, film fans. I'm Jeff. I'm Dave. And I'm John. And welcome back to The Love of Cinema, a pod in which we'll challenge one another to discuss movies both new and old with a strictly positive critical eye. That's right. And to avoid any lazy negativity, we are making this a drinking game. Drinking game. A drinking game. Any negative criticism about a film is absolutely allowed, but it will be called out, and therefore you will have to take a drink. You will hear this lovely sound. Drink, motherfucker! Which means you said something <laughs> negative about a film, or I something ch- I really I would have changed it to that now. I would have changed it to what John said now. <laughs> uh, yeah, Drinking Game Positive Criticism Podcast. <laughs> Moving on! <laughs> So pour yourselves a glass. I'm gone. Pour yourselves a glass. Join us. Give it up for the films we love. Perhaps the films that need some love. Woo! Films that need this, some love. I don't know. We'll see. Week. So we are going to be talking Jesus. about three films from I the know. film year 1997. 1997. A year which Princess Diana had a tragic car accident that shook the world. And a year oh, in no. which Titanic... A year in which Titanic somehow destroyed any other box office record imaginable, maybe with the exception of Gone with the Wind and there's 75 re-releases throughout the racist South. But somehow, (laughs) somehow that's all that the film year 1997 (laughs) got remembered for. But there's a lot more that happened that year. We're going to talk about three movies plus a little other films that happened that year but yeah, first let's like, send it over to john for a couple oh sorry dave what i'm just saying in, in total this this week like just between those two it's five hours of movies yeah like yeah yeah we packed it ten, 10 hours if you count speed yeah. two <laughs> <laughs> and if we add in titanic 72 hours um john you got any shout outs for us just a few and by few i mean two carlos barozzo that is our beer sponsor he has made a batch. Jeff and Dave are going to get to drink it. I'm very jealous. Give him a follow on Instagram to check out his awesome updates for his home brewing. All his beer is delicious. The handle is Cbarozo Bar 2019. That's C-B-A-R-R-O-Z-O-B-A-R-2019. And as always, the music you hear on this episode and every episode is provided by the artist Dasein. That's Dasein, D-A-S-E-I-N. You can find the music available for free downloads at soundcloud.com forward slash Dasein dash artist. All right, 1997. Bam. Oh, my God. So mm. let us... I also get, want to give one more shout-out to our friend Glenn Stoops. You guys may remember Glenn Stoops. What a guy, oh, yeah. actor out of a story. Up, He's an awesome guy. Um, he is launching a podcast with some of his friends soon and reached out to us because he is a fan of our podcast. He loved our 1996 episode specifically where we talked about Fargo and others. Um, yeah, he has a podcast coming up. It's going to be called The Beer Vengers. It's going to be a beer podcast. Hopefully, I'm just going to go ahead and say this. I would love some cross promotion between our beer sponsor, Carlos Barroso, and Glenn Stoops' <laughs> new podcast, The Beer Venger, The Beer Vengers, to see if maybe they want to talk about a local craft brew in the area. And I bet you, Glenn, I bet you, Carlos is going to give you some of the beers that we were supposed to have been drinking for the past six months. <laughs> Something to think about there. And so if look he does, we're coming around your house. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> if you have more Carlos beers than us, we're going to be really yeah. bound about it. We Those... do hold grudges. <laughs> <laughs> Those right. are our beers. They're our beers. <laughs> Before we talked about 1997 <laughs> movies, we're going to do a quick round of news and what you've been watching. Dave. Well, uh, I was uh, actually, I looked up trying to, trying to get tickets to Tenet because bugger me, they released it. Ah, uh, we already hit and... our Tenet quota. We're within the first five minutes. We already hit our Tenet quota for that episode. Awesome. Yeah, sa- sadly, no, yeah, New-, New York City is uh, still not open with cinemas. They're holding back, um, yeah. probably with good cause. Uh, I actually walked past an AMC down on 34th the other day, and it mm-hmm. was boarded up. Whoa, so, yeah. guess they're not coming the back anytime soon. It. Yeah, um, yeah, and uh, like 34th and 8th. Yeah, and uh, other than that, uh, so this week I consoled myself. I watched some more Raised by Wolves, <laughs> the uh, the new HBO show, and yeah. I sat down and watched Re- uh, Fantasy Island, the Blumhouse fam- Fantasy Island. Yeah, how was that? It's was it ridiculous? It doesn't, like, funny? It doesn't it suck. No, it's not funny at all. It, they've done it as oh, a wow. like a horror um, take on it. The Rotten Tomato it, score it, is very it, low. It is very low. Um, I'm saying it's not as bad as they're saying. All right. It, I go. mean, it doesn't. Right. It does. It needs to get to like here, and it gets to like a little under that. 
it doesn't quite it's, yeah. it's a, this is a Go audio up medium up you can't point up <laughs> yeah. I get to here maybe it should just get to there i i used okay. audio description uh, correct all right anything else dave <laughs> No, fuck off. That's all. <laughs> all right. Hey, okay. buzz yourself for cursing so in the first cursing before we give the parental advisory. Your dad um, doesn't have the buzzer. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> Good point, John. I watched um, earlier in the week. I was on the Criterion app. I don't know if any yeah. viewers have that thing, but I definitely recommend it. It's a wonderful app for older films, foreign films, independent films. Um, and I watched Claire Denis French. I watched her film White Material, starring Isabella Huppert, yeah. which was fucking awesome. Can't remember when that was made. 2009, maybe? I'm misquoting that for sure. And uh, I also watched uh, William Wyler's The Heiress, Olivia de Havilland, Montgomery. Oh, Clark. yeah. It's one of Scorsese's favorite films. Yeah, it's a really good film. I did that play last summer, and I've been holding off on watching the movie, and it was, it was featured on the app, and I, I decided to go for it. I'm really happy I did, so... Really, really two wonderful films. And then I love the movies we watched this week as well. So I had five and I'm almost done reading In Cold Blood. And I'm excited because I get yeah. to watch Capote as soon as that's done. So I'm, I'm awesome. excited to finish that up tonight or tomorrow and watch Capote. How about you? Nice. Um, I Well, two quick news things. We had the Dune trailer break this week. Oh, right? yeah. so, uh, did we? What? Everybody's going crazy. I didn't. I actually didn't know what it was about. So it's a boy... With magical powers on a sand island, who has a famous dad and an intergalactic That's war it. coming. I all I'm wondering is, is he a Palpatine? I just want to know, is he a Palpatine? No, he's, he's Harry um, Potter. He's Harry Potter with worms. Right. My only note for the trailer is, I, I just, I really am, I really am getting tired of um, ballad pop um, remixes of classic rock songs in trailers. I don't know why it itches me the wrong way, but. Was that is that Eclipse or Brain Damage? It doesn't matter. I the Pink Floyd song, it, and I was like, I, it really, it really depends on the song too. But like, I'm still True. there with him on this. Fine. Anyway, it, the movie looks tight. No, I Best know what cast you mean, I've ever didn't, seen in a movie. Um, didn't they do that for Roma? That was Roma? the trailer for Roma. Really? The same yeah, song. They used um, either the, it was either the exact same song or it was another one from Dark Side of the Moon, another Pink Floyd song. But I that think is... it was the exact same, not the same version, but a slowed down yeah. version of that. So I was kind of like, oh, I was kind of disappointed too, because you know Hans Zimmer wrote some kick-ass fucking music. Yeah. You know they had some shit locked and loaded for that trailer. I don't know why they decided to do that. Know, but it was still cool. I'm very excited. Using, using Pink Floyd is a lot more expensive, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> so anyway, the Dune trailer. Also, I think we should give a shout out to the Venice Film Festival. The Golden Lion went to mm. Chloe Zhao's Nomadland, which we shouted out a couple weeks ago because it stars our queen, Francis McDormand. Um, and I think this is going to be a movie to watch. So if you can find right. wherever Nomadland comes out, that would be really, really, really Venice cool. Venice was the actual first, first uh, film festival in person, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, yeah, actually, yeah. they actually held screenings, which is good nice. to see. She's, a, um, anyway, she's an NYU, uh, NYU film grad. Yeah, she's awesome. Pretty I saw sure her first film there, yeah. at the New York writer, Film Festival, and it was writer. awesome. Oh, it was so cool. Um, okay, and then uh, what I watched, I watched um, two documentaries. I watched mm-hmm. one that's called My Children Are... My Child is a Monkey. My Child is a hmm. Monkey. It's about uh, monkey moms who raise animals. I would go ahead and say I don't recommend either the documentary or Raising a Monkey. I do not doc- <laughs> do not recommend. Um, oh, I also saw the first episode of The Boys, and I'm off and running. I'm ready to go. The Boys season two is going to be great. It, like, nice. It's sometimes melodrama, sometimes realism. I think it's really, really fun. They, they really and ease then- you in, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fuck. the season's funny yeah with the funeral like the the melodramatic yeah. funeral, it's really interesting um and then um some scientology stuff coming up in there too i also watched and i i've been thinking all week about how to recommend this very 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 quickly but the social dilemma on netflix yes that is a play on the social network um i think everybody listening knows that all of our devices tech companies amazon google Facebook, Twitter, whoever, we know that they're tracking us and we know that they're selling our data to advertisers. So this actually, this this, pod, this documentary interviews um, technicians and people who actually wrote code for these companies early on. And I don't think, I think the one thing we don't understand is that these social media companies and tech companies are actually 
nudging our behavior in such a way that is profitable for them. They actually don't care what we're doing today. They care more about what we're doing tomorrow. So if you look in the, the society about radicalization and other things that are happening, I think it's, it's really hard to ignore the tech element of it. And um, if you know anything about Cambridge Analytica, I would say it's like that times 10. So I would recommend oh, that, wow. The Social Dilemma. Mm, cool. Yeah, it's fucked up. Cool. It's really it's it's really fucked up. If you've gone to a Trump rally, the next day you are 100 percent getting ads for Second Amendment things, Facebook groups for radical groups. It's 100 percent. Yeah, it's true. So the great the great hack is still going on. Basically. It's basically so it's basically saying like the great hack, which is Cambridge Analytica, which was a third party site, was actually right. playing the game. But the 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 groundworks for all of this is actually being done by these companies that find you profitable if they can change your behavior. So they're actually leading people towards a path of description. They're not just posting oh. things online. They're actually baiting you because you're more valuable if they can predict your future behavior, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's mm. fucked up. You That's, should just yeah. give it a listen. If, you, if yeah. you're not a believer, if you don't every buy time, into it, just give it a listen. It's basically the David. plot of Westworld season three. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Dave, every time we talk about this, I think about uh, Futurama when every now and then they show the advertising, how it they advertise in their dreams in yeah. Futurama. <laughs> like it's yeah. it's so hardcore yeah. that they've they've taken over their subconscious. Anyway, we are there, folks. All right, let's nineteen ninety seven, motherfucking seven. Mm. Yeah. Jesus. So box office, obviously, Titanic was number one. Number two, anybody? Oh, nothing. I get nothing. I'll give you a hint. It's also a movie where they crash a boat into the land. Is it one of uh, our movies? No, no, no. That's the other one. So it's the Lost World Jurassic Park came in at number oh. two. Oh, shit. Oh, um, okay, okay, okay. $618 million, which is a shit ton of money in 1997 for sure. Men Ooh, in Black, wow. Tomorrow, Never, Tomorrow Never Dies. Tomorrow Never Chris Dies? Brosnan yeah, I would have guessed, uh, yeah, guessed that. Air Force One, Harrison Ford, right? Gary Oldman, As Good As It Gets. Liar, Liar, $300 million worldwide, which is a great follow-up for Jim Carrey after The Cable Guy, which I thought was was worthy of, of sinking his career for sure. <laughs> that was 1996. <laughs> Comes back strong with Liar Liar. My best friend's wedding and the fifth element and the full Monty somehow all making wow. a ton of money. Mm. Um, other Come awards up, movies. If you, if you haven't seen it, the yeah. full Monty's a great film. Full Monty's great. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Also some award buzz. You've got Goodwill Hunting. You've got L.A. Confidential, As Good As It Gets, Got You Jack Nicholson and Helen Hunt some Oscars, Wag the Dog with Dustin Hoffman, Yuli's Gold with Peter Fonda. You've got Gattaca which had a Best Picture nom, Anastasia and Hercules in the same year. You've got Contact, G.I. Jane, Money Talks, mm. I Know You Did Last mm. Summer, Seven Years in Tibet, Jackie Chan's First Strike, Beverly Hills Ninja, Prefontaine, Waiting for Guffman, Dante's Peak and Volcano yeah. came out all the of, same year. The all of those were not nominated movies. for anything. Yeah. <laughs> no, none of those were nominated for anything. Um, yeah, this was one got, of those years where like there were repeats of themes. There were two Volcano movies, yeah. three ship movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, you've got Jungle Jungle. Movies, three Somebody movies. was leaking storyboards to the other studios, I'm sure, right? at this point. Uh, you've got Selena, uh, Good Burger, Batman and Robin came out and somehow did not make the top 10, which is really bad news. You've got Austin Powers 1. Austin Powers International oh Mystery yes. came out this year. Yes. Air Bud, Scream 2. So you have a ton of movies that we know. Mm. Um, Eight Heads in a bu- Duffel Bag basically told Joe Pesci after Casino, maybe he should retire. Uh, Tony and Michelle... Uh, or sorry, Romy and Michelle. That's an autocorrect here. Private Donnie Parts Brasco. with Howard Stern, Donnie Brasco, Vegas Vacation. Huge, huge, huge movie year. Yeah. Anaconda came out this year also, which was our runner up for choice for our redemption <laughs> movie of the week. <laughs> anyway, that, that's a ton of movies. So, oh, you know what else? 1997 uh, re-releases. They re-released the Star Wars movies. They re-released some Disney movies with some new CGI and such. It was a crazy fucking year, 1997. This is a long intro. Are you guys ready to get into our movies? Let's do it. Hell yeah, dude. Okay, yeah, so it off. obviously you've looked at the episode title. I put Boogie Nights first because it's the more known title, I think. But we're going with Jackie Brown first, which is Quentin Tarantino. This is the Tarantino PTA matchup we've all been waiting for, 1997. So Jackie Brown first. This is Tarantino's next full-length feature film after going um, after Pulp Fiction which came after Reservoir Dogs. So this has been a hell of a 90s. He also wrote some other movies. But here we are. It stars, I would say, Samuel L. Jackson in the largest role of the movie. You've got Robert De Niro somehow playing his sidekick. <laughs> I don't know how he goes from <laughs> Goodfellas to Casino to sidekick, but you got Robert De Niro in this movie. Um, let's go ahead and say the IMDb line for what the plot is, is a middle-aged woman, Jackie Brown, finds herself in the middle of a huge conflict 
that will either make her a profit or cost her life. To unpack that a little bit more, she's a, a flight attendant who flies back and forth from Mexico to California, specifically Los Angeles. And Samuel L. Jackson, um, is she, she's saving money in Mexico that Samuel L. Jackson wants back in Los Angeles. So she's, there's basically a little bit of international, um, I don't know, theft going on here. Um, yeah, that's basically the setup. I'm going to pass it off because I've been chatty already. Who wants to take it from there? Let me just clarify really quickly, because I said this at the end of our uh, episode last week. I said it's the only one that he did not write himself. What I technically meant was that this is not original material. He adapted right. this by, uh, there's a novel that it's based on by Elmore Leonard. So I just wanted to correct that before we get into it. But um, who watched this for the very first time? Who was watching yeah, this for the first I watched, time? I watched this for the it? first time. 100 percent. we clarified that last time yeah i think all of us said that we uh shamefully had never seen this or for some random yeah. reason had just never gotten around to it um i was very pleasantly surprised you guys uh for for many different reasons this uh this soundtrack is incredible i did not mind him adapting somebody else's material at all i'm actually kind of i don't want to speak for you guys but i'm curious to hear what you say because i know both of you uh, you know appreciate him fully but i think you both have said that sometimes you get a little exhausted with how Tarantino, his Tarantino movies are, and how he is just living and breathing in every character in every scene. I felt like this was, um, it was fun watching him adapt something else because even though his dialogue was still very much there, it didn't feel like it was being dominated by uh, Tarantino style the entire time. Um, I thought the performances were strong. I'm not sure why Robert De Niro's in this movie, but he's right. in it, and of course he's good. <laughs> I am very sad that Samuel Jackson did not get an award nomination. I don't think I've ever seen him. He's always wonderful. He's always uh, great in, in all of Quentin's movies, especially, but he's usually in supporting parts or in ensemble parts. He's definitely the protagonist of this movie, the male protagonist, and or I guess antagonist, whatever. Antagonist, he's the male yeah. lead of this movie, and I thought he hero, was maybe? absolutely wonderful. I thought yeah. he was so fucking good. So as usual... We got kick-ass music. We got amazing performances. Um, and it's one of those, you know, we, we knew we were getting into halfway through this movie. We were going to be following a bag of money. And I thought he made it compelling. I, I, maybe it was a little bit too long for you guys, but I, I had a good time. Um, I, I, I was smiling throughout. There wasn't too much blood or too much cursing. I didn't feel like I was being dominated uh, by any of those kinds of elements. I was just watching the story unfold. And the acting was strong. I don't know. Yeah. Did, did you guys just, just disagree? So, I was just, very pleasantly surprised. I'll, I'll send it to David in a second. Just to follow up on that, that's my biggest note I had in a good way is exactly what you said at the beginning of your your speech is this is Tarantino is always the main character in all of his movies. Love it or hate it. That's the truth. He's great. He loves movies. So it's great. And we forgive him for that. You can tell right from the opening montage, which is we find out to be Jackie Brown, basically late for work, r walking through an airplane terminal to this awesome kick-ass music to the title scroll. It's so, so good. And you know he's there, but this is similar to maybe um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It's the one where you could forget. Maybe you you definitely know from the beginning, but you can forget that this is a Tarantino movie uh, because he just sort of lets the lets the work. It's simple. It's not too complicated. And I, I, yeah, yeah, it's definitely the one where, where he hides a little bit more than he does in other films. Dave, what do you think? Well, fun fact, um, the I, I did like the opening sequence where she's uh, getting to work and the, yeah. the credits roll as she's on yeah, the, cool. like the travel latest thing. Um, same cinematographer as Devil's Backbone, which we covered um, uh, wow. recently. Oh, cool. uh, yeah, Guillermo Navarro uh, came nice. back to that. And, right. like, and as a, like, it was great to see someone who loves movies working with someone who really knows how to shoot movies because uh, yeah. mm -hmm. there's like certain shots like where Samuel L. Jackson puts Beaumont in the car and then drives to the lot next door, but the camera leaves the car and then drifts up over the fence, and you just you're like a bird on a wire watching the shot, like what happens from a distance, and like some of these shots are fantastic and stuff. But yeah. like as far as and you you're right, I like I tend to go a little sideways on Tarantino. He's not my favorite. I find him incredibly self indulgent sometimes. Um, but it meant, like the opening scene had Samuel L. Jackson, Robert De Niro, and Bridget Fonda in it. Yeah. How am I bored? 
Yeah. <laughs> like, also, a foot, also a foot shot within five minutes. Thank you, Quentin. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. His, his fetish was it, like, shameless it was, in this it was, one. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it was so shameless. much superfluous dialogue in the first, like, you know, scene that I, I'm just like, get to the point, get like, get past it. Luckily, it gets better. Uh, and I think you can kind of tell when he swings back towards adapting the book. Uh, but there's yeah, definitely mm-hmm. like there's definitely some classic Tarantino dialogue for the sake of dialogue in there. Um, mm-hmm. But much much of a much this almost feels like a, like a Coen Brothers movie at times. Yeah, to yeah, me, like sure. the, the, with thinking... the with the plot and like I I, I went fucking cross eyed tracking who's like double crossing who at some point. Yeah, I kept thinking. Um... Cause I do like Tarantino and it, even though I totally agree with you guys, it, his, it, it works for me, but I, I kept thinking when I was watching this, this was almost like a glimpse into what his career could have been. Had he not been so wildly successful with Pulp Fiction, if he mm-hmm. had been somebody who kind of went back and forth adapting, working with cinematographers who had a lot of influence on the way that they created shot list and the way the movie was presented, he was still in charge but it felt like he was blending in with the filmmaking around him a little bit more. I could have, I could have watched ten movies that felt like this. If I, you know, that don't feel like a Quentin Tarantino movie every single time. And I still think he would have had a, a magnificent career. I love. I would love to ask him. I've heard him talk about this movie, but I would love to ask him to his face. Like, do you feel like you still have credit over this the way you do over your other films, or if this one is kind of something that you separate in your mind because it's not. 100 percent yours and you didn't have like you know the initial idea and stuff because i agree with you dave i felt like you've watched uh it was much more accessible to anyone who was interested in a crime it's, it's not a thriller what, what, what no. would you guys what, what would you guys call it's, it it's, it's like almost a, like a heist a, film yeah that's yeah, yeah it, it feels like a heist film yeah yeah i'll tell you what though like, uh, I, so I, I, I agree with so what you were saying before about like samuel L. jackson Anytime you exasperate Samuel L. Jackson is my fucking favorite thing in the world. Yeah. Like whenever he's, he's like, what the fuck? Like, I love yeah. that. But, it's, but they let like him be patient. Yeah, they did. They, they let him get there on his own. And like, yeah. he has some which, other which solid time, Do you have one in a moment in particular that you're talking about? Cause there's one in my mind specifically that was. It's when, when it, he goes right, and sees right her at the, at the bar. Um, well, it, no, mine's right at the end of uh, the, that opening scene that I was talking about where he takes the phone call. Yeah, yeah. And oh, he's yeah, just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, how the, the how are you, you in prison? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like yeah. when he's at you the know, bar with yeah. Pam Greer and she's like, oh, I just told him everything. I told him I'm running the guns for you. Or I told him I'm right. bringing the money for you and that you're running the guns. He's like, you he's having to like whisper there's no right. one in the bar so he doesn't want to talk loud and he's so upset and they just held on this very simple two shots so you can't even see their whole face. Yeah. Just two pros acting their ass off. He went all over the place and the scene when he convinces Chris Tucker to come down with him, that whole, mm-hmm. that, that, the writing, the acting, everything, but I thought that was a masterful scene. Every step of the way, I was just so impressed with Sam Jackson. I've just never seen also, him on screen this I much. I mean, also, how, how is Michael Keaton even likable in an interrogation scene? Mm-hmm. Like, you just, he is, you just never li- not like that guy. He's, I know, yeah. he's so good. Jeff? Um, this reminds me, so so the heist element of it, actually, it almost seems like it set up um, the Ocean's Eleven series. It seemed very Soderbergh-esque <laughs> the way. So just to give everybody a little, also the 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 style, back. I always talk about how things remind me of plays. He reminds me so much of plays, not even so much Mamet. I'm thinking more like David Hare or Rabe, um, if you guys know your playwrights. But anyway, I'll, you said before a super, superfluous dialogue. What he does is he uses the dialogue, not that every word matters the way that it does in other movies, where every single word seems like it was really worked and edited. It's more about what that type of dialogue does to somebody's emotions over time, which to me draws on like early Scorsese movies like Mean Streets, where it's like, yeah, some is superfluous, but you need 10 seconds worth of shit in order for the character to get riled up. And you that only happens when you give them time and space. Um, so just to fill people in a little bit more now that we're here, um, it turns out it's Jackie Brown. We don't know her name at first, but she gets caught by the FBI with money in her purse coming back from Mexico. And so the FBI basically says, we know that you're smuggling money. And um, she knows that they know that Samuel L. Jackson is the source. So she tries to play along. She tries to play both Samuel L. Jackson and I guess Michael Keaton's the FBI um, at the same yeah. time. Who are So the FBI is tracking to try to get the Actually, source think, of the money, Keaton's which is Samuel ATF. L. Jackson. He's ATF. Okay. Yeah. 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 
Uh, and she's in, in the middle and she kind of has the choice. Does she play with the FBI? Does she play with Sam? Or does she sort of deceive everybody? And so it allows this heisty thing where you don't really know her motives. Uh, you sort of know Samuel Jackson's motives because he runs a crime syndicate, but very small, very casual, very open, um, which is really, 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 really cool and fun. So yeah, there's, there's if you've if you've ever liked an Ocean's movie, which are very rewatchable, you know, it, there's some heisty elements in this that are very similar. Um, and do you know what I love more than anything else? And John already said the word; he took it right out of my mouth. Do you know what I love more than anything else? Is a fucking two shot in film, man. Now, of course, I come from I, I loved theater first, but. Two shots, basically just two characters on on camera. Usually it's a medium, so you see not their whole body. So you can see close enough that you can really see their face in every single movement. But you give them enough wiggle room that they can kind of use their arms a little bit and show some body. And I think sometimes, you guys would know better about this. So I'll leave my thought with this kind of open question. A lot of directors, I don't mean to pick on Marvel, but they show you every single thing. The directors cut and edit so much that they're spoon-feeding the audience exactly what they want you to see. If you do a two shot, it's actually showing more power from the director because they trust their actors so much they trust their frame so much that they know that the storytelling is strong <laughs> and so they give so they Don't give stop. The, keep they, going <laughs> oh my god the gush okay but but anyway but anyway Good but think stuff. about it tarantino's so good and he does so many slick camera movements in all of his movies he's so slick that in this when you just do a two shot of samuel L. jackson and and chris tucker Jesus, it's so weird to talk over. <laughs> anyway, you that actually shows more power in the director because you know that he trusts everybody on his team. You know this movie's coming out okay when he has that level of trust to be able to give a full minute to one shot. That's my speech about the two shots. No, I, I, I mean, well, movies. Yeah, fuck, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, there God are a lot of them. The gush. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> no, I'm glad you said that because I, I had a feeling both of y'all were going to react this way. And like I said, I was really pleasantly surprised. I don't know why I've resisted this for so many years, but... His style of cinematography in this movie is is incredibly different, and I think he's such a unique, um, a unique director with the rest of his canon because he is somebody who's really intensely stylized um, that still has dialogue that gives actors enough to play with. But coverage wise, I think he often moves the camera around, you know, a, a, an unusual amount of time. Unlike the next guy we're going to be talking about, who likes to sit still and focus on uh, actors a lot more. So again, it was so, it's not that I want him to do this all the time. Um, it was just refreshing to see him stretch his legs a little bit. I'm thinking of a million two shots right now, but one that I thought was was so effective was um, a lot of the apartment shots. It was a small apartment. You could tell they were actually inside it. And uh, there's one where Pam comes in the next day and De Niro's in the forefront. And she takes Samuel L. Jackson outside on the patio and screams at him through the glass. And they have a mm -hmm. whole screening yeah. conversation uh -huh. in the background. Yeah. And De Niro's just there looking at Bridget's foot is in the shot. And De Niro's yeah. just kind of watching TV and looking at her foot and getting high. And everything you need is there. And you're right. It gave it that different element where Quentin, uh, Quentin, it is, who, uh, was, it's, what's the name oh, of the cinematographer? Uh, Guillermo. Navarro. Yeah, yeah they just Navarro. I don't know if they they decided like we're going to just shoot this differently because because it's a book but they it did create this element of trust within the actors which again just stylistically I think they both were smart enough cinema mm -hmm. people they knew they were making a book from the 70s I mean, so they it, were like let's try to yeah, lean in that direction fun as well to like dirty up your frame with actors like so <laughs> I mean when you've got that's well, what I'm saying though when you've got like, I'm not saying he doesn't celebrate his actors in his other movies. Clearly, he writes amazing roles for everybody in every movie. But there is something to be said about mm. this medium can just sit back and let really great actors go to work. It's no, not a proscenium I mean, stage, but your eyes like, can do the work. When you when you yeah. dirty yeah. when you dirty a shot, you like put something in the foreground, and usually it's a plant or a prop or something that you're just mm -hmm. like obscuring a little bit just to to give it a bit of depth. But they used actors for this. Yeah, mm -hmm. like there's they, always something in the they, background. Yeah. Even even POV from the trunk up at that's, Samuel that's Jackson. That's a trade. That's a trademark shot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. From the trunk, you still see a tree or something in the background to give you some depth and stuff. Yeah, exactly. I also I fucking love Chris Tucker. All right, this is the same yeah. year as yeah. Money what Talks. A cameo. I saw yeah. Money Talks like four times growing up, and it's not because of Charlie Sheen. All right, I just think Chris Tucker is so good. He has such an incredible personality. We, we've talked about him because he was in um was he in um. Right. I can't think what of it. What did we talk about him in? Are you talking about, I don't remember. We, we haven't talked about Fifth Element. So. Which also came out in 1997. <laughs> um, 
Anyway, I just fucking love Chris Tucker, and he he has a cameo role in this that's so good with Samuel L. Jackson. It's like if I'm De Niro, I really thought De Niro was just gonna be in one or two scenes, and I thought that would have been like a fun little one off for him. But it's almost like he's like, I'm just happy to be in the crew here. I'm happy to be on the team. I just want to be a part of good movies. To everybody who thinks I just take Raging Bull roles and that's it, or gangster roles, I'm ready to just smoke some weed and definitely a a different one for him. I'll tell you what though, my favorite scene I think was uh, like when Samuel L. Jackson goes to see Jackie after she's just got out of. Oh, uh, jail yeah. and it, you're like, you, it's well established that the last person that this happened to was killed and they make yeah. no uh, like no mistakes about letting you know the same thing is going to happen right now and he walks in and suddenly he stops like when they're in mid-conversation he's like is that what i think it is and it's like is if you think it's a gun pointing at your dick and there is yeah. no way to misinterpret a gun pointing at your dick it's yeah. like a fantastic power swap in this scene. Suddenly, like he goes from He's big to small, yeah. and you realize yeah. that she has the power over all of them. It's it's yeah. a great. And I thought scene. that was I thought that was another good example um, with the cinematography and the way they were kind of just saying, "Let's not do too much here." Mm. The lights in the room go off and on several times in in line with what you're talking about. We know that Samuel Jackson is trying to turn the lights off so that he can kill her and no one will see him through a window, and they leave the lights off. And these are two. Uh, African-American actors and everyone knows that, you know, you really, you could not see anything when the lights were off and it was on purpose and they were still moving around freely and holding these shots, following them around the room so that you felt like it it had that atmosphere of, I guess, I mean, it it almost felt theatrical. It was a big, long, there were a few different long takes in that, in that scene. And I thought it worked so well. And I, to take it up a notch, Dave, I don't think that turn would have landed as hard for me had there been a lot more coverage. It needed that. Yeah, no, that that definitely almost even, that tired end of the day, and yet there's this pressure. Even, where even the fact kill the her. whole thing was done in silhouette, like it it all worked to yeah. perfect the scene. Like it, it's, it's beautifully, it's beautifully shot. He's so funny in that moment. Yeah, yeah. My, my, I mean, my <laughs> only thing is, well, like when we get when we get into the like the heist itself, it's almost like it, it jumps into that, and then the style of shooting changes, and that's where it does get a lot like Ocean's Eleven. But yeah, I, yeah. I felt like it, it did a similar thing to what Bullet did, and we spoke about Bullet um, previously, and it, it set something up to pay it off later. The problem is here he does it in reverse, so you're getting the payoff, and then they go back and show you the setup, but. Sometimes the payoff is a f- like a five minute sequence, and you don't know what's going on. And by the time mm-hmm. they get to going back and showing you the setup, you kind of like, I don't care. Yeah. I, thought, uh, <laughs> I thought there was a last like technical thing I'll say just to keep 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 going with this technical meeting good actors. Like when you do this well and you don't have to do too much, um, it was obvious to me, and I, I looked it up just to make sure. They talk very loud in this movie because a lot of times they're shooting this open coverage, two shots, wide shots in a, inside a, a room, you know, and they're not super close to anybody's face. Even the close ups are more like medium close ups and stuff. And then they, at the very end, when Sam Jackson makes, um, what's his name, Robert Forrester's character take him to his bail bond place to confront Pam Greer for the last time, mm-hmm. they are in a car and they shot with super. The camera was right in front of their faces because it's the only scene in the entire film where they are like whispering to each other. Sam Jackson, it's so intimate. It's the only time in the whole film. It took the entire film for him to whisper to somebody. He's been screaming and yelling and he's been upset and it it created this intimacy right before the ending Mm. that I thought was just so unique. And again, it just reminded me Mm. of the way because they did so much live coverage dialogue in the 70s, it reminded me of a very intimate scene from the seventies where they're like, no, 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 let's just push in. Let's do a real close up. We don't have to have the camera 10 feet away and we'll follow this later or do ADR. Let's do it right fucking now. And let's get the dialogue live. I thought it created this, I don't know, this element of intimacy that had not really existed in the film before then. So that it almost, I don't know, for a moment, you were almost kind of on his side. I, just, I don't know. I just thought it was smart, very simple filmmaking yeah. techniques yeah. throughout. It was very effective. Yeah, I mean, I, for, you, for what I for what I would say, I'm I'm glad I watched this. I'm really glad I watched this. Yeah, hell yeah, it's on, Jeff. What were you gonna we, say? We, wa- we watched it on Stars. I was gonna say, um, it's very, it's also very LA. I think that could be a good like for anybody who's still listening to this podcast right this very second who is thinking about whether or not they should watch Tarantino's tenth most famous film. Um, 
the Big Lebowski is to like the LA in the valley, like the northern white, I should say, LA. This is like the Compton's heist LA movie where it's it still celebrates just LA culture and, and being in South LA while the heist elements are going on too. So I think the setting is very appealing and it's very simple. I think it's a very simple movie and I definitely think it's one people should check out, especially if you have stars or the stars extension on Hulu. Mm. Um, but that's kind of it. What, what about, okay, my, my question for everybody though is, now that we've praised this movie a lot, if you're to pick a... If you're to pick a Tarantino movie, you're going to choose one of the sexier ones, right? You're going to choose one of the the splashier ones, right? Whereas, would you would you do that? Like, if who you're am like, I, I recommending watch a Tarantino this to? Is this, movie like, tonight? is this like someone who's never seen a Tarantino movie that we're talking about? Or well, I'm just asking you, like, if it's tonight and you're like, you know, I want to see a Tarantino movie. This is probably not going to be high on your list because it doesn't feel so much like a Tarantino movie, right? Yeah. So when you because people yeah, always do that, they rank agree. the Kubrick movies, they rank the Coen Brothers movies, they rank the PTA movies. For the Tarantino movies, this is never going to make it to the top because people are going to say Pulp Fiction and people are going to maybe say Inglorious Bastards or occasionally you'll get a Django or a Reservoir Dogs or whatever. I'm, but I'm I'm in the camp I'm in Camp Django. That is some of uh, yeah, it's great, but like, it's splashier, right? There's some more fun shit that he does. This one true. is very except, except for one scene in in Django where he uh, tries to do an Australian accent that just does not fucking work. He should not have cast himself. He should have realized his acting days are, are done. Especially he since he's movie. right next to one of the most famous Australian actors we have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, but Samuel L. Jackson and Jango is amazing. You. Oh, my God, yeah. Yeah, I do agree with you. It was, uh, uh, it's not, but not because it's bad, right? Like, mm-hmm. we, we've, we've clearly said that. It's mm, not yeah, that it just it's doesn't feel as much as like a Tarantino movie. Good. But, yeah, it doesn't feel quite the same. And maybe, maybe just... We've been Pavloved at this point that if we hear Tarantino, we we immediately think about blood and guts and fast pacing and fast cuts oh, yeah. and zoom lenses and Bill, women yeah. with swords and yeah <laughs> yeah so and no feet. I know you're totally right. Although I am uh, kind of hoping I, I thought about this when one of this was done. I'm kind of hoping that I'll change my mind on that. Like I was so pleasantly impressed yeah. with this movie that I'm kind of hoping it'll start to creep up his you know, the list in my mind of, of his movies. Cause I, you know, just never even considered this being one of his top, top nine yeah. or 10, but I definitely think, I think I liked it more than Reservoir Dogs. I know um, that's some cool. people say true, but you know, it's true to that one from the old school, but um, yeah. I, I liked it definitely more than Reservoir Dogs. Awesome. Well, I think because I know that we're going to spend some time talking about our next film. I think we should head off into break unless anybody has any final words. Pam fucking Greer. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Foxy Brown. Did you guys see? I was looking up the trivia yeah. <laughs> when she came over to read, uh, to talk yes. to Quentin and have a meeting with him about it. He had all his posters up as Foxy Brown and all his kick ass yeah. roles from the 70s. And she was like, Did you put these up because I was coming? He was like, No, I almost took them down because you were coming. <laughs> I think that's fucking <laughs> that's awesome. awesome. Clearly, yep. he loves her. I'm so oh, glad yeah. he brought her back into yeah. movies. I discovered her, discovered her. I knew who she was, but I watched the L word at some point, like 10 or 15 years ago, whenever that came out. And I was like, who the hell is that? And I watched a couple of things with her from back in the day. I knew she was Foxy Brown, but I had never seen it as a, you know, when I was growing up. So no surprise. She was fucking badass yeah. in this I mean, movie. Oh, the way she Brown. plays it, like from the get go, you're like, this is not a woman to be trifled with. And then yeah. she just fucking lives up to that legend. Like well, she brings it to that character. It's amazing. Well, and to what you said before, Dave, by the time, um, we realized that Samuel L. Jackson has killed people who almost flipped on him. And then he meets her at the, a couple times actually, but then eventually at the restaurant at the bar, it's like, she, I, I, I still am trying to figure her out as this goes. I think Quentin does a really good job and she plays it perfectly where I can't tell how innocent she is or if she's the mastermind behind the whole thing. And I think she, I think she's the mastermind behind the whole thing. I think she's fucking brilliant. And I had mm, no idea. Yeah. Like she played me. Oh, she's so she's, good that she didn't just play the character. She played me as the audience. She's member. gratuitously underestimated the whole way through. But what a phenomenal performance. Awesome. Glad we, glad we yeah. talked about it. Yeah, absolutely. I think she's... Uh, <laughs> I feel like it could have gone... In, again, in lesser hands, it could have gone into... Uh, somebody could have played that over the top and either, like you said, like either winked at us and let us know that she was in charge. Or she could have come off as being... Um, as as like exploiting herself in that role that she like mm. was because she was the mastermind that she was going to be. Cause you know, she played these kick-ass female characters in the seventies and the eighties. And she, yeah. she was not that in this. 
I felt like she still pulled it off and none of us were surprised by the end of it, but she had a, uh, there was a, she was acting on her feet and there was like a discovery that she was doing. So even though Dave, that scene was fucking awesome. And when it, you know, when she has the Mm. gun and she turns the scene around, I was still a little scared for her. I was still a little nervous for her the whole time, even at the end, spoiler alert, even at the very end of the movie, when you realize that she was playing everyone. So the cops were in the bail bonds office with her. When the showdown goes down, she has a scene when she's alone in that office before uh, they show that ending. And she's, I thought she was totally alone and I was frightened. She was like rehearsing how she was going to pull the gun. I was like, Oh my God, she's going to get killed at the end of this movie. This is going to be a tragedy. And then she just fucking pulled it off. But I never once thought that she was. That's that's funny because not it, it once a, did I think she was going to die. <laughs> really? Yeah. I yeah. mean, I wasn't like, I wasn't convinced she was going to die, but I was just kind of worried because she seemed like there's no way she's going to pull this off. Like it just she, seemed she like. Pulled, like th- she pulled so many smooth moves. I'm like, no, this character is undefeatable. Like she's, she's going to walk away with it. And let's just say Robert Forrester. I get it, dude. I'm glad they took their time and let her walk into his life in slow motion yeah, because cool. wow what a woman that scene was super I mean, powerful every guy in that movie was blown away by her not i'm not talking about sexually just like they could not get a grip on jackie brown she was just always surpassing everybody's expectations and i think you know it takes somebody like pam greer to just fucking walk right into that he couldn't yeah, have made this I mean, movie I, without her i will retract my earlier comment about um it was the superfluous dialogue was boring because whenever she was on screen didn't notice it once so even if, even thank, if it was even God. if it was like <laughs> gratuitously overwritten, she just owned it. It was an amazing performance. Hell yeah, Winston Salem, North Carolina. Shout out, that's where she's from. Oh, <laughs> oh all right. Watch this so, movie. That was super fun. Great soundtrack. Great. I know we already oh, said it. Oh yeah, great Fucking soundtrack. Well, listen, I mean, it's if, on Spotify. Give it a listen. Also, if there was ever a spot to cue Johnny Cash, that conversation in the bar is it. <laughs> yeah, that nice. was wonderful. Tennessee stud, right. dude. Yeah, right, wonderful. Fans. We're gonna go. We're gonna go ahead and get a refill. Listen to some Dasein, and we will see you in a second. And we're back. We're back. We're back. <laughs> oh my back. gosh. Oh man, what a what a time well, to talk yeah. about Boogie Fucking Nights, man! Boogie I, nights. I'm, I'm just so gonna say, excited. you guys, this was the best week of soundtracks we've ever had. I've been listening to the music from these movies nonstop. Are you kidding me? How lucky are we? Both of these soundtracks are ridiculous. Tell us Can about Boogie ahead? Nights, Jeff. I'm just curious, Jeff. Jeff, did you did you watch this with your family? <laughs> did anybody watch I this? Actually with watched their mom? this. I actually watched this in an empty house by myself. And it was Ooh. awesome. Did you? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What? No, I did not. Get the fuck out of here. Um, <laughs> uh, so, Boogie Nights. I waited till I was totally alone. I waited till I was completely alone to stop. watch this movie. It's not like porn. that. It's not like that. Mm-hmm. It's not about porn. Where the laptop at? So, Boogie Nights is a movie about porn. No, I'm kidding. Boogie Nights, as listed on IMDb, is the story of a young man's adventures in the California pornography industry in the late 70s and early 80s. That is so vague, man. This is Paul Thomas Anderson, who you may know from The Master, and There Will Be Blood, and hopefully you forgot about Inherent Vice, and a lot of other fantastic films that he's made. He's an awesome, 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 awesome... He's an awesome, awesome, awesome writer and director. He wrote this and directed this when he was 26, 27? He probably wrote this when he was like 22. Um, Yeah, he was 26 or 27 when he directed this movie. It stars... Are you ready? Yeah. Mark Wahlberg, cool. kickback. Well, we hear Julianne Moore, Burt Reynolds, Luis Guzman, John C. Riley, Don Cheadle, Heather Graham, and can you can you can you say Philip Seymour Hoffman? Can you say Philip Seymour Goddamn Hoffman? You've also got um, Dylan Baker Hall, uh, William H Macy. Jesus Christ, what a fucking cast! Anyway, it's about a young man who at seventeen is discovered by a. Uh, porn director who is played by Burt Reynolds in the film and then I'm assuming after he turns 18 he starts becoming a pornographic star back in the late 70s when those kind of movies could only be shown in theaters in special art house cinemas for specifically for this kind of content um, so I guess you could say there was he Burt Reynolds certainly thought there was more class 
and more posh. And then you can see the industry exploding, no pun intended, uh, as Mark Wahlberg's star continues to rise. And then let's just say the 80s hit and cocaine addiction and cultural norms change and he becomes a little bit of a falling star uh, with a little reconciliation at the end. So I guess generally that's what it's like. This is another L.A. movie. This it's is a case very, of video, very video LA. killed the porn star in this case, but it didn't video kill the porn star. <laughs> uh, is this in the is this in the valley? They never really say, but Paul PTA always writes about the valley, so it's got to be the, the the valley, right? San Fernando um, Valley, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio was originally set to star in this and decided that he should do Titanic instead. What a stupid choice! Uh, and so <laughs> he recommended Mark Wahlberg, with whom he worked on. Um, the Basketball Diaries. Right. There's a huge yes. what if with all of these movies. Uh, Julianne Moore met Paul Thomas Anderson at a party and he said, you should be in my movie. You're perfect for this role. It's about the porn industry. She didn't get it. She read the script and one of her first scenes was her crying on the phone because she lost custody of her child because she's a porn star who's addicted to cocaine. So sad, so amazing. Burt Reynolds was not the first choice to be uh, the director of all of the films. Although they did uh, ask him Jack like seven Horner. times. They asked him seven times and he was nominated <laughs> for an Oscar. And you could tell if you go back and you watch Robin Williams winning for Good Will Hunting, you can see Burt Reynolds react as if he really thought he was going to win that Oscar over Robin Williams. He definitely thought he was going to win this. Um, anyway, it was nominated for a couple Oscars, including Best Writing, which it lost to Ben Affleck and Matt Damon for Good Will Hunting. Um, this movie is so fucking good. I, I'm just I'm just talking stuff now, but this movie is so goddamn good. There are so many good characters that I actually listened to a podcast once that was ranking the 15 greatest characters in Boogie Nights. There are 15 mm. characters worthy of being <laughs> mentioned in this movie. Also, for, for anyone who uh, follows the adult film industry, and it is one of the biggest industries on the planet, um, there are some notable appearances by actual adult performers in the movie who play... Is it? Yeah. Like Isn't Ron Jeremy in this for a second? I no, they, they, got... they cut him. They cut him out. Which oh, is, they did cut him. That was a uh, a good uh, call, knowing uh, where he ended up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, uh, let's have let's have Dave go first. I know John loves this movie as much as me. So let, let's see. I don't know, Dave. What do you talk to me? All right. Let's let's start out. Burt Reynolds is spectacular. Yeah. In this, yeah. he just owns yeah. every. Okay. No. Correct. Correct myself. Everyone is spectacular in this. There's not a fucking bad performance in it. Oh my god, I said it's... a name wrong. I said Dylan Baker Hall, it's Philip Baker Hall. I'm so sorry. Dave, sorry. <laughs> no, you're right. Uh, the even like the opening credits is it has this slow, ominous, like droning music, which is like the perfect foreshadowing, foreshadowing to what's actually gonna happen um about, mm-hmm. you know, halfway through the film. And then it just and then the party bursts to life. And it's the seventies and it's magical and everybody's making these adult films and we're all getting everything we want and it it really takes time to pull you into that world and then snaps the rug right out. Yeah. And I, I love that like William H. Macy is so concerned about the script of these films. <laughs> um, you know, so there's fun. some great little in jokes in there. It's, there's just, it's phenomenal. And like the cinematography as well, uh, Robert Ellsworth, the cinematographer who went on to shoot uh, Mission Impossible Rogue Nation and Ghost Protocol there will be blood, King of Staten Island. There will be blood. Um, yeah. yeah, he he adapts his camera style as he goes. Like you start off and there's actual motivated camera movement. Like when they're sitting in the diner and the camera starts to like block out one character because the, like the character that we're focusing on, their attention is entirely on that character. And it, they just roll that person off the side of the screen. He's still talking, but he's not on camera. And like there's all these wonderful motivated movements of the camera. And then... Later on, when everything starts to go to shit, we settle down into your standard, like, two shots and, like, over the shoulders and, like, answering shots and stuff like that. And it's it's a great just little change because it adds into the Wonderland that they're set up at the beginning. And it's not a Wonderland. It's It, it goes... Okay. <laughs> do it. Do it. Just leave that music on for yeah, this no, entire it's, segment, it's, it, dude. Like, uh, We're it's, only going to gush. It's not. Yeah, that's the end of Dave's like, Oscar. It's not a Wonderland. It's it's like eventually, you know, the party's Shut over up. and the, the lights are turned on and there's questions that need answering and I feel like it really takes. I'm going to turn that off. It's, it's like yeah, I feel, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, but I, I tell you what though, I feel like if I ever shot adult films, I'd be the DP character in this movie. Adult films? That's funny. Um, yes, that's that's funny. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, give me more lights would. and a better lens. So. Dave, I would cast it because that guy, isn't he also the editor? Isn't the DP also the editor? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. He's a, <laughs> uh, it's a uh, Ricky J, right? He's like a super yeah. famous magician, like card, card trick guy. And they mm-hmm. got him to do this. Um, yeah. Let's talk about Elswit for a second. That's a, that'll be a fun way into this. I think mm. he is a cinematographer. He's obviously he's worked. He's one of the best and yeah. he's worked with so many people. And it's just such a good example of like, like, um, like so many great cinematographers, he has just enough ego so that he, you know, you might not know it's, it's him when he's shooting it if you're just looking at it blind. But when you find that out, you're never surprised because they're all beautiful movies. But he can work with somebody like Paul Thomas Anderson, who I guarantee you had every single shot planned out years before he ever met with him. And he can still bring and elevate that to something beautiful. Or he can work mm. with somebody like Judd Apatow, who really doesn't know what he wants it to look like. And he can elevate that and make it more beautiful. I mean, it's just such a yeah. He's yeah. got so he's got he, you know he's he got a, make, quite he a can, range. He can make Tom Cruise look tall. <laughs> yeah, he I also mean, the... <laughs> he also shot Gigli, and that didn't ruin his career. So that's pretty awesome. Mm. <laughs> yeah, the, man, the man can make it work. Um, he won an Oscar. Guys, won an Oscar think? for There Will Be Blood. I mean, there there is some great yeah. stuff in this. Even like, um, I mean, it's yeah. it's almost a different movie though when it gets to the eighties. Like it, the the tone of the on, film yeah, changes. Yeah, definitely on purpose. And, and like, the color this, palette changes, right? Yeah, yeah. And a, lot, a lot of the color starts getting sucked out. Um, it turns into like blues and like darks, like. Mm-hmm. Whereas it was oranges, browns, and everything for the the seventies. Yeah. Um, but like when it all goes wrong and he starts looking at other things to do. That recording session in the second half of the movie is just fucking painful, but so much oh, fun yeah. to watch. It's, and it's you like, got the touch. It's like make oh it God. stop painful. One of and I love that they literally in that recording session do it. This one's for you, Al, our our, our roommate, our ex roommate that we talk about quite often on this show. He had told me before that in the eighties, they literally everyone was on so much cocaine that music sounds different because everybody was having trouble hearing. Uh, the highs so they were that's why in the recording session they're like i think the bass is covering up the vocals and it's like it's not and they're like can you just take the bass down and it's like let's just turn the vocals and the highs up so like i mean that literally was happening i thought there's so much I, funny commentary mm. um so this is a movie go 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 what do you got no no well, you i go was first. gonna say as as you know john i worked at a restaurant where we had some some celebrity clientele talked about matthew broderick before don't need to bring it up again um <laughs> Alfred Molina came in. (laughs) Alfred Molina came in and sat down at a table, and I realized that I was singing Sister Christian to myself like 10 feet away. Because literally, the second Alfred Molina came in, I literally just had Sister Christian and Jesse's Girl stuck in my head because he has one of the great cameo performances of our lifetime in this movie. It's it's three songs long. Because it goes from Sister Christian into <laughs> yeah. Jesse's Girl into because uh, he's because he's got the fuck, awesome I forget the tape. next film it's it's a very different I forget what the third song is the third song is basically when he runs outside and starts shooting and, and it doesn't even end so there, he gets two and a half songs while um, Thomas Jane who you may know from HBO's Hung or Showtime's Hung um, it, it plays another member of this crew here anyway I just wanted to mention Todd! There are so God, many good characters. There are so many good God. scenes. And but the, yeah, what makes this movie great is the characters. And so I'll say the anecdote that I know both of you know, which is um, uh, Stanley Kubrick, when he was working on Eyes Wide Shut, I, I think it was actually Tom Cruise that introduced Stanley Kubrick to Paul Thomas Anderson. Uh, maybe that's not true, but um, Paul Thomas Anderson met Kubrick and he said, oh, yeah, I, I directed Boogie Nights. And Stanley Kubrick goes, oh, my God, that's awesome. That's so great. I love that movie. Congratulations. Um and then Paul Thomas Anderson said, yeah, thank you. I, I wrote it, too. And Stanley Kubrick apparently didn't respond and just walked away. Apparently, he was, like, intimidated by this 26-year-old that had written it because his writing was even more intimidating than his directing of this film. And the film is directed brilliantly. But back to what I was saying about Jackie Brown, but even more so about this. Every single character has a through line. They all have their own scenes. Don Cheadle mm-hmm. basically has, like, two scenes and then a lot of ensemble work. Um, William H. Macy, his final scene in the film is, is unforgettable, if you've ever seen this movie. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then, obviously, the, the cock, in, cock in your ass. She has a cock in her ass. Scene. She has an ass in, my, ass in her she's cock. An ass in my, yes. She has an ass in her cock. She has an ass in her cock scene, which is also a two-shot <laughs> where the actor is dirty the frame because everything's happening in the background, and it's, it's a steady, it's on them. 
Anyway. Actually, at that point, you're supposed to be looking at the guys in front, Jeff. Yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Damn it. Anyway. Um, it's, it, it is sensational. It's sensational work. And what's funny, too, is that it has a good amount of Paul Thomas Anderson getting credit where he's due. So the opening sequence is a giant one shot that ends with the reveal of Dirk Diggler, or I guess um, whatever his character, Eddie, but, Eddie. Uh, yeah. the, the lead of the film played by Mark Wahlberg. So you see almost, you see the club, you see Louis Guzman, you see Burt Reynolds, you see Julianne Moore, you see Roller Girl, you see John C. Riley, you see Cheadle. You meet all of these people all in the same opening take set to this fucking awesome 70s song. And then you see Dirk Dickler all in the same shot. He does another one in the pool sequence. So he gets his credit where it's due. And then there are also times in this movie where there's like a three minute, just, just hold in one setup for a long time on these actors. It, it has everything. This, this movie's so good. I, I don't even know it where really to go does. It is, yeah, I know. It's kind of like 2001. I mean, he's in he's in company with Kubrick. Like this, he's 26 years old. You are obviously, and anyone who has not seen his first feature, Hard Eight, which stars Sam Jackson, John C. Riley, and Gwyneth and, Paltrow, and a few Baker years Hall. before in 1993, <laughs> in Philip Baker Hall, um, who's wonderful in it. He's also shot by Robert Elsmith. Um, yeah. Also shot by Robert Elsmith. Works off to Sundance. Um, this, this, so this was not his very first one. That movie is also wonderful, but it's a it's a slower paced a true like crime figure it out thriller kind of more like jackie brown except i think it i think it's better than jackie brown boogie nights though if this is his first foray with here's a real budget here's a studio behind you and we're going to give you a whole bunch of stars and we're going to see what you can do with this little voice you have i mean he took advantage of, he of everything shouted it from the rooftops i mean he's yeah. he's a fucking genius this movie has is equally you know you, you know when you're in that world of masters because you don't know what's more impressive, the technical or the storytelling, like the the actual writing and the character development, which could come out of a writer or a director, or the way he approached actually making this. He fought for it to be shot anamorphic, which was not done very often back then. He wanted mm-hmm. it to have a certain look. Um, I yeah, think they, he, they really went spherical in the 90s. It was a big thing. Yeah, yeah. He... Every time I watch this movie, I feel a little bit different about it. There are themes of family in all of his movies. I think all of his movies are about family in some regard, usually with people resisting, trying to find, and then because of their own issues, resisting to be a part of a family. That's why I love Boogie Nights so much, because it is his family movie. It is one of the only Mm -hmm. ones, I think, where everybody desperately wants to be a part of that family. It's also a love story. I mean, Burt Reynolds literally... Mark Wahlberg and Burt Riddles literally see each other across the room. And there are stars <laughs> on the board behind Mark Wahlberg as Burt Reynolds looks at him. I just think there's something wonderful waiting to get out of those jeans or whatever that <laughs> line is that he says to him. So there's like a love story involved. Obviously, there's this tons of this family drama. And like all Paul Thomas Anderson movies, because I struggle. I was talking about this with my brother today. I struggle with slice of life movies sometimes. That, Sometimes there, there's not enough juice in them for me. I, I, I like drama. I like characters to be affected by what has happened to them. Paul might be one of the only people who I think has found a perfect balance, for me anyway, a perfect balance of these people just kind of live their life in front of you. And there's such a... Yes, oh, two in the same <laughs> segment. How did I not get gushed? And, yeah, it's so good. <laughs> there's, such a, uh, there's such an ensemble feel that you you do you do kind of feel like you're just watching these people live their lives in spite of the drama that happens and people die and stuff. There there are eight deaths in this movie. There's like nine. several people get killed in nine. nine. Body counts nine. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Dave. But by the end of it, <laughs> but by the end of it, because people, especially in this one, because in, in all of his movies, these people resist the changes that are happening to them so much that it's it's still interesting. There's enough drama there. But by by the end of this one, I feel like this is the only one where it ends and you really do as fucked up as you just saw that entire fuck world of pornography and drugs and the people who were really, you know, enabling that culture in the 70s. You kind of want to be a part of it. I, I kind of want to go live at that house. And yeah. I kind of want Burt Reynolds I mean, to give they, me a hug. Like, they make, as my they dad, make like, you a part of it. That's the thing. And like they draw you in, they make you a part of the party. You're celebrating with them. And that's why when the 80s hit and they just like it all goes horribly wrong from that point on, like for everyone, like some of them get out of it, back crawl back out of it, some don't. But like that's why the second half of the movie is so impactful because you were at that party 
and you you like that party you had fun at that party but now that that's gone and you've got to deal yeah. with these hard like like three of the the aforementioned uh deaths that we were talking about happening in a fucking donut store yeah oh my god that's like <laughs> that's, yeah, i'm never going to dunkin donuts again after fucking watching yeah. this like and then and then don Cheadle just stares at the bag of money and it's just calling to him oh it's so good yeah it's so good but the one thing i do and find the, um, i do find interesting is this is one of the rare movies where uh because normally in, when you're like writing a film you'll have the characters start in one place and finishing in, in another and this is one place where the characters don't really change like they I'm pretty much end up where they yeah. start yeah like it, and it's like there is very little that changes except for the experience that dragged them down and they got back to where they were and it and normally that, normally that doesn't work and for those for some reason it really does in this one it's and that's true of like all of his it, that's why it's so impressive that he did it with his you know, again, Hard Eight was his first one, but he, this is like the one that most people think of as his first stamp. It's so impressive that he pulled it off so successfully his first time. Punch Drunk Love is probably the only one where people dramatically change yeah. throughout mm. that movie. It is a, a you know a straightforward love story, yeah. but all of the other ones. D- Daniel at the end of There Will Be Blood, he's alone in that house, just like he was alone in that fucking hole at the mm. beginning of There Will Be Blood. Phantom Thread, they were still fucked. You know, the list goes on and on. I also think it's it's again he's got a. Paul Thomas Anderson knows he's good and he knew he was good. Then he's got a huge fucking ego. The, the commentary on wanting to make a good film at that time when the nineties was, was booming. That was definitely a a renaissance of film and there was some good stuff happening, but the digital age was starting to creep in. Um, There was a lot of pressure uh, for the giant commercial successful thing was starting to happen. Obviously, Titanic came out this year. And Jack Horner, Burt Reynolds has that line in there. I want to make a film that is true, that is right, that is a mess in the lineup, that is honest mm. or whatever it is. Yeah. Like he ends talking about wanting to make a movie that good and how they're all basically willing to sacrifice almost anything for it. And then they're not. And then they just kind of fall in line and they, they adapt. Mm. But I don't know. I feel like Paul... I mean, sticks it, his, he rears his head out and just says, no, 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 there is still a way to do this. It might not be for everybody. He knew this was going to be a cult film, but everybody knew when they saw it. I remember when this came out, this was the first cult movie that I remember experiencing in real time. I remember people watching it. I remember people saying, our parents aren't going to want us to watch this. I don't think this is going to win any Academy Awards, but this is our fucking movie. Mm. This is our movie, yeah. dude. Big sleepover movie. Yeah, I mean, well, the, the the cool thing is, it's a great, it's a really a cautionary tale about accepting that other people are going to move in. Like, there's always going to be the new kid, uh, and mm-hmm. just moving on gracefully, and the dangers of ego wrapped up in the most flamboyant fucking rapper he could find, which was the the seventies porn industry. Yeah, and it it really yeah, translates I mean, into a fucking amazing story. Yeah, I think he's. It's so obvious too that he's a. Uh, He's so influenced by Robert Alpin, uh, Nashville, the player, Mash. You know, he, the guy is just uh, him and Jonathan Demme. He always cites them as his biggest influence. And Robert Altman's ability to work with scripts, he didn't write all of them, I don't think, but his, his scripts, he uh, working with developing these ensemble pieces. How do you introduce a million characters very quickly? How do you, how do you balance storylines over lots of people? I think it's rarely done in cinema. It, it doesn't get done very often. We see that more in sitcoms and television. And um, again, it's just so impressive that not only does he introduce you to all these people successfully within the first three minutes, but then he balances a two and a half hour movie very well so that you care about everyone. And then, mm. yeah, Jeff, Jeff, he introduces fucking Alfred Molina. It's just this random, you don't have to care about this person. And yet that random cameo becomes one of the most iconic scenes in the movie. He adds on just one more person and it raises the stakes on everybody who's already there. Genius I mean, storytelling. He's a fucking genius writer, dude. Maybe Philip Seymour Hoffman, maybe even after Scent of a Woman, Philip Seymour Hoffman, I forget, a Twister was around the same time period. Too. That might have been 99. So he wasn't, Philip Seymour Hoffman wasn't who we, we know today, but he has like, he's, in, he's a straight up ensemble member of about three scenes. And then he has a 45 second scene and a, 30 second scene and he is unforgettable in this movie and a lot of that's paul i mean throughout the whole movie you just give him one little scene you can see what's going on and then in the rest of the film you can see the consistency every single character is a through line if there was a if there was a person on set who was only filming one character at a time then everybody would have their own spinoff mm-hmm. just for what was captured in this film 
Like it, it, it really is. It really is sensational. And and don't even get me started on the the what could have been's with all like the. I know we have other friends at a podcast, which is called what was what was the name of that? What was the name of their podcast? Um, and almost and, starring. And yeah. almost starring. Right. Th- this is a huge example of that. But either way, no matter what, even though this cast is incredible. It, it, Paul, it, he's he's got it. Paul, whoever well, let's was point in out these that, roles, like, because we kind of fantastic. almost started talking about. Our, you know, I, I alluded to we will be talking about it with Jackie Brown. We were talking about how Quentin Tarantino he does highlight his actors. He works with amazing people. He writes great dialogue, but that typically the way he covers, um, you know, most of his scenes, I would say, like there there are certainly plenty of long tracking shots, and but the the camera gets moves around so often in his movies with such a stylized fashion, Quentin Tarantino. That I've always admired Paul Thomas Anderson because Dave said at the beginning of this, he he the camera is static when it needs to be static, but it is often motivated with a lot of movement that comes out of character. And nothing happens without influence from character. And yet, yeah, you never feel like you're impeding on the actors. You are following and just watching actors act. And this is just again, he does it in all of his movies, but this is just such a a strong step in that direction to say, I don't know if he was, he probably was, that guy, he knows what the fuck he's doing. To just say, first and foremost, hello world, I'm a genius director and I might be the best actor's director alive right now. I mean, every single person who works for him says the same thing, that he just creates this element on set mm. where you feel like you can try anything and there's just so much trust. He could not have gotten that kind of work out of ensemble members had he not had that kind of skill set. And you listen to him, in interviews, when he talks about actors, he grew up in Hollywood. His his parents, his father was in the scene. Um, and he just talks about how much admiration he has for actors and how much he loves them. And you can tell that I think he's basically just, how do I write a good enough script and get a good enough DP with me and we can get enough money behind it so that we can point to camera at these people that are so wonderful. Oh, yeah, 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 another sure. gush. It. Wait, I want to say one more. Sure. Fuck it. Fuck I want to say fuck one- it. I want to say one more really, really fun thing, too, which is just even more just incentive to love this fucking movie. So Hard Eight, as we referenced, was Paul Thomas Anderson's first movie. He sold out so much to the producers of that film that they actually changed the title. That was not his intended title. Um, And he was so Mm. furious about it that when he did Boogie Nights and he actually was getting ready to get it made, the movie opens with the words Boogie Nights on a cinema uh, marquee in lights that are like blowing up with fire they're so hot and that starts this long one track shot that i talked about before that introduces all of the characters because it was his way of saying i refuse to let this movie be called anything else it is literally on the marquee at the beginning of the movie you are not going to cut it out of this one shot take at the opener this is the name of the fucking movie. It looks so good on the marquee, doesn't it? Go fuck yourselves. And that's how he opens this movie. I think it's so cool to have that. I think yeah. it's awesome. Yeah. And just like the last thing I'll say, and then I'll shut the fuck up. Just like with Stanley Kubrick, how we were like, how the fuck did that man not get nominated for Best Director? Yeah, go I'm fuck just going to call yeah. it right now. I bet Paul Thomas Anderson, there's a good chance he'll never win Best Director in America. He has already won Best Director at Cannes, Can, however you want to pronounce it, Venice, and Berlin. And I bet he will not win Best Director here at the Academy Awards ever. And he, he you know, would have won. He, w- he would have won for there, but if for whatever reason they didn't just get fucking obsessed with No Country for Old Men, which was a good movie. But he would have won that year. It's it's tricky. You never it's know. It's crazy. This movie is incredible. You even if you don't love the subject matter, if it's a little intense for you to watch a movie about, he has been quoted trying to say this movie is about family and all these things, and then he said, you know what? It's a movie about a guy with a big dick. So even if you don't want to watch a movie about a guy with a gigantic penis in the porn industry, I bet the storytelling is good enough that you will still be compelled. The yeah. music is incredible. Mm. And the performances, you know every face yeah. in there. So I think everyone should sit down and give it a rewatch if you haven't watched it recently. And definitely if you've never watched it, treat yourself to Boogie Nights. Dave, any final thoughts? No, I think we're good to move on. All right, so Dave is now. Well, because we did are... just break the, uh, I think we just broke the record for number of gush alarms in one yeah, second. Yeah, I think so. John, John's drunk. <laughs> oh! um, so we, my we are He's still my not doing the whole new movies thing, which is how we sort of started our podcast through three episodes. If yeah. you want to go back into our my feed. cinemas are boarded up. Cinemas, yeah, Dave's cinemas are boarded <laughs> up. So we are going to continue with the random year generator. So Dave, are you ready to take it away? Let's let's do it. Let's uh, ooh, fire it up. Let's 
So we picked a year somewhere between 1930 and 2020. 1930? And I forgot you went back that far. Yeah. It came out at 1960. 1960? Oh, sweet. All right. Cool. Well, I can't name a single one off the top of my head that came out in 1960, so we're going to take a I quick can. break. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to pee, and we're going to talk about Dave's one movie he knows in the year 1960, and we will get back to you in a second. See you soon, <laughs> film fans. We're back. We're back. We are going to announce the three films we chose from the film year 1960, which actually has some more famous titles than I gave it credit for at the end of our last segment. But more on that at the end of this segment. We need to get to our redemption segment of the podcast. Or was it really that bad? Was it really that bad? On the podcast, we are going to talk about Speed 2. Now, really quickly. Can you please read? The subtitle as well. It's Speed 2 Cruise Control. Yes. Speed 2 Cruise Control. <laughs> also, um, just, just before we get into that, it. I should point out that in particular, some people have taken exception to some of our choices for this segment. So we do have uh, now an open question oh, yeah, yeah. on our yeah. Facebook page where you can list the movie that you think deserves a redemption or was it really that bad with the year. And we're just going to keep that open thread going. And if your year comes up, we'll do your movie. Absolutely. Yeah, please respond. This a lot of bad movies. We want to this hear about movie, it. We've already got one. There's already one there. This movie is on the IMDb bottom rated movies at number 92 with a 3.9 out of 10. Speed 2 Cruise Control, 1997. On Rotten Tomatoes, which is out of 100%, Speed 2 Cruise Control has a 4%. 4%. <laughs> On Rotten Tomatoes. Context. I, I don't often agree with Rotten Tomatoes, but when I do, it's Speed 2. <laughs> Context. Speed 1, starring Keanu Reeves and introducing the world to Sandra Bullock as the second bill, made $360 million worldwide on a $40 million budget. It has a 92% on Rotten Tomatoes. It was a hugely successful movie. Speed 2, then, gets a... $160 million budget and no Keanu Reeves. Gee, did he know something that we didn't know? Gary Oldman hmm. was offered the role of the villain in this movie and turned it down to do Air Force One. Is he the smartest person alive? Is he a genius here? Is he a genius? <laughs> $160 million we'll, we'll budget. That. $100 million of it definitely went into the final 15 minutes of this movie. <laughs> But on Actually, a, they meant to do that for about 25 mil, I heard. So the the tagline here on, on um, IMDb is a computer hacker, who we find out later to be Willem Dafoe, breaks into the computer system of the Seaborn Legend cruise liner and sets it speeding on a collision course into a gigantic oil tanker. Now... The speeding on a collision course to the giant oil tanker is about 20 minutes out of this movie. <laughs> that starts about an hour and 10 minutes in. There's a lot of other shit that goes on. Yeah. And it's it's like a secondary target, too. It doesn't even... It... Yeah. 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 I, I wrote down here that it, it I, I, everything I just said, it opens in just... It, it opens like it... The Fast and the Furious movie took the 3% good out of the beginning of this movie and then just left the rest for scraps. Jason Patrick, who I only knew from Entourage as Jason Patrick, um, is on a high-speed chase. <laughs> is he... Is Jason... I don't know. Is he a cop? What is he? FBI cop? I, I, oh, he's Officer Alex Shaw, and he's on a high-speed he's chase. What? He's what? He's... He's on the Suicide Squad. The suicide Remember, squad. that's the sure, name. Sure, sure. Of his he's chasing, LA he's chasing what looks like an ice cream truck up a hill in in was it L.A.? It doesn't fucking matter. Anyway, um, and then he gets into a crash, and Sandra Bullock simultaneously is taking a driver's test. And honestly, she's so bad. It is so. It's not even funny. Bad. It's so ridiculous that I, I actually thought it was doing the miscongeniality thing. 
where she's actually brilliant and she's pretending to be bad for humor, but also to play, you know what I mean? And and the fact that that was serious was a really big surprise to me at the end of that scene when she fails her driver's test. I thought she was going to be like DEA undercover or some shit that they were going to make. But instead, she was just a bad at her driving test. And then it and it is it is trash. But long story short, they get them on a cruise ship. <laughs> <laughs> and then they get them on a cruise I, I, ship. I just want to say, yeah. I just, I just want to say, like, have you been to IMDb and looked at the trivia for this? Because it has one of the best trolls ever at the bottom of the list. If you scroll right down, it says uh, that the, the film's script was written on the back of a bar napkin. The napkin was subsequently left at the bar. Therefore, the cast and crew had to wing it during production. Pretty fun. <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty fun. Um, that, that's Fantastic just, troll on IMDb we're trivia. Gonna... <laughs> We're going to call this movie Fast and Furious on a boat, but if Fast and the Furious sucked. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, don't defame the good name of Fast and the Furious. Okay. Yeah. Well, because it opens with a car chase sequence and it's called Speed, so you get it. And then they go on a cruise ship. And you know what's really hard to do in a cruise ship? Find Speed. It's just for. The, the, I mean, yeah. all right, so this is. Did Captain just, Phillips mean, study this movie massive... for research to say, what can't we do? How do we make sure we don't I mean, bomb the, the pirate movie? Like, how do we do this? this I mean, the opening so, of this film yeah. is actually really good and it sets up the plot nicely. No, the opening of the film is so trash. I did, I, I, no, it's great. I would, I would advise everyone to stick with it because it takes at least half an hour to suck completely. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I wrote that. One of my notes right here is minutes 10 through 30 were fine. Not great, but definitely not terrible. There was, <laughs> they were leading to an inciting incident. They laid on maybe a little thick, but we get the we get what's going on. The two of them are in love. I guess they're, they're he's gonna try to propose to her on the boat. Willem Dafoe is a hacker who wants to hack the the system of the boat, and and we get it. It's pretty simple. The lines are stupid, but like I'm on board for. <laughs> 10 to 30 is totally fine. Those 20 minutes and then that 10 minutes where the cruise ship is crashing into the land, 10 full minutes, that is great. I'm, I'm totally fine with that. The other hour and 40 minutes, it was it was the Titanic, but after it sunk, if they only filmed after everybody had died. I mean, how did they get Willem Dafoe, dude? I mean, money, I $160 million money, dollars for this like, movie. Money. I mean, it's kind of like... Their first offer was to Gary Yeah, Oldman, Gary Oldman's in. And then they followed it up with Willem Dafoe. Yeah. So, Jan, Jan, Jan de Bont, the director of this movie, who was coming off hot, he made Speed, which is good. Yeah, Speed good. is a good mm. action thriller movie. That thing is good. That, people still talk about that. Then he made Twister, Jeff, you ah. referenced earlier, 1996, which I remember... I watched not too long ago, I, and I, I said it in what you've been watching, and it, I remember I was kind of let down by it. I, I like Speed definitely more than that. So watching this follow-up to Twister, uh, he only made two more movies after this before he was not allowed to direct anymore, I guess, <laughs> or, or yes. I decided to to hang it up. The Haunting He's, and Lara Croft, Tomb yeah. Raider, The Cradle of Life. And in that's, 2003. that did it. it. He's in a farm minute. upstate now. So this is what I kept thinking, though. I'm not going to lie. I, uh, this is not a good movie for sure, but I think my expectations were so yeah, exactly. low with that 4% tomatoes rating that I kind of went into it, especially with that. I said, you know, read the subtitle. Cause I remember thinking there's no way somebody wrote this as the sequel to speed. I bet this was just some random boat disaster movie script sitting on somebody's shelf. And they were like, Hey, we need a speed sequel. It's let's, funny. Let's you should mention that, that. You know what it originally it. was? Die Hard 3. No. This was the plot for Die Hard 3. No. Yeah, this, see, this feels, feels like a like Die Hard movie. So, yeah. There we go. It definitely does. It 100%. feels like a Die Hard disaster. Like it's it's not Poseidon Adventure. It's not straight up natural disaster, but it has that feeling of like it feels more like a disaster movie than an action thriller. Where speed feels like a suspense action thriller with also, the, the murders. Why happening is Jason and the, Patrick uh, taking control of this stuff. cruise ship? He is not trained to be the safety engineer of a cruise ship. That definitely seems like a John McClane plot. I'm so glad you found that, Dave. He, yeah, he, he also seems to know things that he shouldn't yeah. just shouldn't know. Also, yeah. Die Hard Three knew to yeah, not use this stupid just... script. Don't rewrite the the first one works because it's an empty building. We have a crew who's trained for this in this movie. I'm glad they didn't try to do that for Die Hard, even though it would have been better than yeah. And, and also, life. like, let's let's establish our hero so that he's a, a fitting Keanu Reeves replacement. I know we'll make him a liar, an overly jealous boyfriend, and a guy who can't let go of his job. The guy who goes skeet shooting the second the, the second the day yeah. on the cruise ship off the back deck without telling Cedric he sneaks out. Yeah, what a guy. 
but but as but he's really says, nice. The, he's says, really nice yeah, you to the deaf me. girl that he he can do sign language with. That was that was kind of sweet. Yeah, that was that was the little yeah. uh, that was the little redeeming moment. It's like oh, we might make you actually like him. Oh, John, what were you saying about? No way, John McClane. No way, John McClane knew sign language. They, <laughs> they did they write? <laughs> who who wrote for Sandra Bullock? They they took the Die Hard script and then they didn't say. You know what? Sandra Bullock mm. became a huge star from Speed One. Writer, okay. I think the whole like writers don't know how to write female characters, so therefore they write tropes and stereotypes. Anybody who thinks that should study how the fuck Speed One comes and Sandra Bullock becomes a huge international star, and this is the role they give her in in Speed Two. That was yeah, no, trash. They, they she is literally, so much better like, than that. It was li- yeah. there were literally sections where um they s- put them in situations so they could repeat the beats from Speed. Yeah, like sh- when she uses the yeah. chainsaw to get right. through the door. And then they're like, oh, we can get out if you move. She's like, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. It's exactly the same line she delivered in yeah. the first movie. And they gave in the middle of the, like, they gave her the like line. They, they're just sorry, repeating they, themselves. They gave her the line, I'm so scared or I'm so nervous, like 30 times. And I know that we, the audience, sometimes maybe writers feel safe if the characters announce the terror that we should be feeling as the audience. But Jason Patrick never said that. Willem Dafoe never said that. And so who's our fourth biggest character in this movie? Nobody. So I guess they decided that Sandra Bullock is the only person that's supposed to be worried or scared, which leads to a very two-dimensional per- character that that she's just better than. And you watch the movie, and I, I didn't blame her for a second because I, I sat there and I was like, she, this is not right. There's something here that's not right. I mean, t- to be honest, like Jason Patrick is really just saying lines at some point. So yeah. like he's not even... Like he's just re- like repeating what he read just before they roll camera, but both him and Sandra Bullock pretty much only did this film to finance other projects they did afterwards. And I, I mean, yeah, there are just so many. There's so many like bad things in it that are really funny. The funny. Too. There's like, so many funny things. We would have had so much fun watching this together. I think if the three of us could have. Watched yeah, this I was together. like, I really wish we were watching this. I laughed out loud a lot. It just some bad things. It, Willem Dafoe knew what movie he was in. Like he, he that laughing ridiculous. at the end is so the way ridiculous. he pushes his laughing of course mm. the way he throws the way he hits the captain with this like metal thing that, that there's no the captain wasn't even in that part of the he wasn't even close to that thing <laughs> and Willem Fo, i can't i can't even sorry audience members i can't describe this correctly but there are these little bows that hang off the side of the ship and apparently they rotate and they're only like four feet long and this is an entire like 15 foot walkway around the deck of the ship. And the captain passes Willem Dafoe and they they cheat the filming of it in such a way that it looks like Willem Dafoe cuts him off with this four foot metal thing and beats him with it and throws him off the ship. The captain was nowhere near it. The guy who replaces him, when he has both, both of his arms are broken by the end of the yeah. movie. I kept thinking of Mufasa, Will Ferrell's character from Austin Powers. Oh that God. guy got bust up Mustafa, in this movie. Right? Doesn't matter. Yeah. Mustafa, Mustafa, yes. excuse me, excuse me. Uh, but yeah, Sandra Bullock's everything they wrote for also, her was just you, really you offensive that other, you, and disappointing. You recognize the other guy, right? He's uh, he was uh, Jango Fett in Star Wars. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I did recognize him. Hmm. Um, I Wait, don't really know. Where let's else talk to about go the funny moments. I mean, let's, again, I kept oh, okay. to I, myself. I have some. I have some points. Okay, like, good. Willem Dafoe as the villain. Yeah. They the okay in Speed One, Dennis Hopper. We get almost to the end. There's a little bit of action still left over, but they finally corner him and he reveals his motivation behind everything. And so at this point, up until this point, you don't know why he's doing this, and so it's there for discovery. Willem Dafoe runs into the captain and blurts the whole fucking thing out, and he's pretty I, much going to smash a cruise. I, like he's yeah, he's pretty much like it cheapened the character, and he's pretty much just going to smash this cruise ship into like an island because he lost his health benefits. I I reference that in um, now that I live in America, I understand that it's a joke. political yeah. it's a political movie, Dave. Speed to Chris Control. You, I, I reference that in Superman, Brendan Ruth, Kevin Spacey, whatever that's called, where the villain halfway through the movie says their whole mm. and it's just not realistic at all. It's just so ridiculous. But yes, they do that in this movie. But can we talk about some of the funny things? So I've I definitely have seen for sure mm-hmm. the final sequence where the cruise ship is gonna crash into the land. And I knew that it took 30 minutes for this cruise ship. It just, that it's, it's so funny. Anyway, um, can we talk about some uh, of the funny moments that happened during this I mean, that it, make this whole course, movie thanks, worth thanks watching? To the, what, Dave? Thanks to the MSC Opera in Venice, uh, this movie is now a documentary because they actually did that crash into the dark. I mean, Jesus. Holy shit. <laughs> I didn't know um, that. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. That was real? 
No, no, no. That's a cruise ship actually smashed into a dock. The MS, oh, the, oh, the opera. Um, sorry. <laughs> there, so this cruise wow. ship, okay. which okay. can't break, is crashing into the dock in the Caribbean, right? It can't <laughs> break? Are you fucking kidding me? Nothing works right, right, on this right. fucking cruise ship. Yeah, I can't even see the push forward, to be honest with you. But anyway, um, and somehow nobody in the bay notices the cruise ship that's crashing into the dock. And so you get scuba divers who are, dive under the boat as it's coming because they didn't notice it you get um sailors obviously getting out of the way but my favorite line in the entire movie is <laughs> this cruise is this cruise ship is like 30 feet from shore and it is going straight into the fucking dock it is going to destroy this town and a boat a guy jumps off a boat and says we have the right of way here that is an exact quote. We have the right of way here, which it says to a cruise liner that is very clearly on a reckless path of disaster, as if it can talk sense to a cruise ship boat. That is so fucking funny. How does nobody see this coming? A boat goes yeah. flying into a restaurant. You have people wakeboarding in front of the cruise liner. You have it is it is so great. The whole final sequence is totally worth it. And then the Willem Dafoe, very diehard esque death. I might, I must say, the Willem Dafoe crashing the plane into a pole <laughs> and then living. Is yeah, so after, all funny. The, after all their, after all their fucking work to not blow up the oil tanker, they blow up the oil tanker. I mean, they basically said, I mean, that explosion was this, ridiculous. Movie, <laughs> and back to the, uh, the, the thing where you thought I was talking about, they actually did that. Um, to an extent they did. They built a full size rig of the front of the, uh, the boat and build a replica of the dock and literally ran it on tracks and smashed it into the dock so a lot of slow motion yeah a lot of that was uh, a lot of that was real um as to an extent like it was a life-size construction that's why the end of that film cost so much fucking money all right without a doubt the guy who gets the acting award for me is the who's he scottish Scottish for sure uh, that guy gave it one thousand percent yeah he he, he he was all of his training went into this big break he thought he had. Um, yeah. Just, all of it's just so bad, you guys. I mean, the, the callback <laughs> to, I uh, know, oh the callback to, um, was the guy with dreads at the end who has the boat oh, and he's yeah, in speed, yeah. you know, yep. he's, in, he's in the first one for no reason at all. They like put this coda on at the end then, where he's heavily then, involved yeah, at the very end. A, yeah, oh. a thing. Did they think speed three was happening or something? <laughs> I mean, I just I tell don't you, like, understand why that was there. It's so conflicting too, because like that end sequence has some of the best practical and the worst CG effects oh, in yeah. the same scene. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I don't know, you guys. Again, I, I, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be, only because I kind of told myself I have a feeling this is not, this is not actually supposed to be Speed Two. It's just a ship movie, and shit mm. goes wrong. And, and if I look right. at it that way, and I pretty. I pretend Sandra Bullock is not. I remember I just kept saying to myself, Academy Award winner Sandra Bullock. <laughs> Academy Award winner yeah. Sandra Bullock is is saying these lines. This poor woman. I mean, she herself in an interview has called this movie a steaming pile of trash. Yeah, so. I mean, honestly, it's just. And it's I'm, just, I'm sorry, really like, not strong. while we're on the subject of Sandra, seriously, every time she leaves the fucking house, speed, speed two, the net, gravity. Bird box. I'm starting a petition to get her to stay home. <laughs> yeah, I think she oh, might want to. Did, right. did she leave you the house in 2020? <laughs> yeah. yeah, gravity. Gravity, yeah. she left her. No, I counted gravity, yeah. That was in there. You you nothing but like, seriously, nothing did, goes right did, for yeah, this woman. She, le- she no. obviously left the house somewhere back in January and 2020 is all her fault. <laughs> Matt Damon is still more expensive to, to the United States government, though. Than her. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, with, with the Martian and Saving Private Ryan and Bourne, yeah, the Moon movie, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, how well, bad, how much, how much worse would this movie have been had Willem not been in it? Uh, exponentially. Yeah, like yeah, I mean, at least if, he if was it wasn't somebody like him or Gary, like, that, like, that's or the, even I mean, Gary, that's one of the like, things I like about Willem Dafoe. Like, he will take something that is, for lack of a better word, trash, <laughs> and he will bring something to it that just elevates it yeah. just a little bit out of the out of the, the shithole it's in. He'll, he'll do his job. Wait, I think this is an important question though, especially for our fans that have stuck with us here. If 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 you were if the three of us were together and we got drunk and we watched this movie, 
I don't know about two hours and five minutes, but we would have had some fucking fun watching this movie. Yeah, right? I think I was disappointed I watched it alone. I think it's worth Same. it's a fun bad movie. I thought it was, you know, you can pick on it and you don't feel bad about picking on anybody in it. Definitely invite your friends around and have a drinking game with this one. It's on Hulu. This is is, uh, this is one definitely a group watch. Um, Wait, let's let's make up a drinking game really quick. Okay, let's say um, anytime Sandra Bullock says she's scared. Go ahead and 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 (laughs) actually then don't drink. Pour one out for the writers of this fucking film every time she says like. Okay, any, what's, it, what's any, another any good time, one? Anytime they open the side of the ship and water trickles in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's anytime, good. Anytime Jango Fett gets injured. <laughs> mm-hmm. Anytime <laughs> the supporting character... That's good. Anytime a supporting character has one line and it's offensive. Do you notice that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. The, these people come in with one line and there's like, there's just big women here. What? And it's like, yeah. I mean, adult women. And it's just like a bunch of fat women. Like, come on, get the fuck out of here. Like, it's also, not worth it for like, the comedy. Like, he's like, I don't, I don't see anyone else taking their pants off. Why is not she taking anything off? Because I'm not wearing oh, yeah. underwear. <laughs> Who is writing this shit? <laughs> sexy. Se- and then it cuts down to like a sexy shot of her legs or something. I was like, okay, come on. <laughs> I know they um, tried. That was one thing. All right. To actually say that. Uh, yeah, we, we can keep going with this game, actually. What, what else do we have? Uh, I, I don't know. Anytime, anytime the music, anytime, anytime, the, anytime the music sounds like another movie, I swear <laughs> when she gets she's she goes underwater and Jason Patrick has to save her because music? she's a woman, so obviously she can't swim. I swear to God, they ripped off the Little Mermaid. It was literally like, ha, <laughs> like it was, also, trash. Like, it was trash. What the fuck up is the water lava? The water, Every time the anyone lava. falls in the water, they immediately die. Why did that fucking sailboat explode when the ship touched it? Good question. Good question. Sailboat Nothing apparently it was just everything else lined broken too, with gasoline. But this one sailboat's just like boom! I'm gonna fucking explode. When they, when they are trying to pull him in, there are some wonderful like bad continuity shots or like just bad yeah. executions. This boat is supposed to be racing forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's supposed, supposed to be racing forward, and they're pulling what's his what's his name? Patrick? Jason Patrick? Jason Patrick? Yeah. They're pulling him in, and it's supposed to be going full speed and. There is no current moving against him. <laughs> yeah, They're just also, pulling also, him in like just, tepid water. Just previously, they established that the blades of that rotor are twelve feet long. And <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, is wait, how has he three fucking miles from it? Because that was not a twelve foot like. <laughs> that was not <a> twelve feet. <laughs> You know what else? Uh, These old movies, and this includes Die Hard 2, but any other movie that has either radar or sonar, they don't know how to move the blips in a time that's dramatic. So I swear to God, that oil tanker, when they introduce it and they see the oil tanker coming at it, if you just look at the sonar, impact is in 15 seconds. It's literally like, <laughs> bap, 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 bap. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, there's a 20-minute sequence. Ooh, it's ooh, like, I got, get I got the fuck out of here dr- with these old I got, sonar I got shots. another one for the drinking game. Anytime someone says they don't know how to use something and then proceeds yeah. to tell them what each button does. Yeah, that <laughs> happens a lot. How about all the, the technical things? Uh, every time like there's a ridiculous, are you kidding me? That's not actually how you do it technically. The first time you see Willem Dafoe plugging up all the cables from the cruise ship into the little box that says the Fios cable converter box. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then he types, he, ty- he types in executions to the computer program that says things like when to execute, and he types now. <laughs> he doesn't type like he doesn't yeah. type like a time countdown. It just says now. I mean, there's so many things like that. They're just like God. So, God, one person could have made this decision better. Yep. Somebody also, just had to change a computer graphic, and it could have made it better. All right, I feel he's like we, like the, we could also, go. We could go also, on for hours. He's a computer hacker who like kisses his equipment too. He's like, oh my god, my USB port. Oh, it's so weird. Okay, sorry, Dave. We were moving on to finish <laughs> yeah, our episode. I, I, yeah, I don't think I live as contagious. That's the anymore. Speed Two it's... drinking game. It's on Hulu right now. I had more fun watching it than maybe it came off though. I did. I didn't hate this as much as I thought I was going to. I hated a good hour of it, but the rest. <laughs> Well, that's me. That's for me. Yeah. No, that's for Jeff. It's for both of us. It's for both of us. All right, sorry, Dave. Bring us home. Get us out of here. All right, we're moving on next week to the uh, the year 1960, and wasn't this a fucking discussion? Like yeah, we, I think we took longer than we ever break had to, took... yeah, to decide on what movies we're doing, but we are doing The Magnificent Seven, The Apartment, and a movie called 13 Ghosts, 
We were almost doing a movie called Horrors of Spider Island, but we looked at the trailer and vetoed it. It was so it was fucking bad. bad. Really <laughs> yeah, that's, how, that's how bad it looked. There was no question of was it really that bad. Oh, so yeah, Billy Wilder's we'll The Apartment. Yeah, that that would have been the shortest seven. fucking segment ever. Was it really that bad? Yes. Yes, it was. It, it, was, yes, an, it was. It was an hour 17. I was rooting for it so hard. Um, that's it. John's, Film fans. Yeah, it's going to be good. That was a good episode. See you guys. Uh, Watch. See you next week. Thanks, Quentin fans. Tarantino and Paul Thomas Anderson. That was great. See you next like, week. Like, subscribe. Find us on the socials in our episode notes. <laughs> <laughs>